okay for, I should have had to read the gospel. And I heard, always fun. And then to hear something from, that was from the Hunchback of Notre Dame, wasn't it? That piece of music, well, beautiful. Hey, in 1996, I had the opportunity to travel to Israel. If you ever get the opportunity to go to Israel, it's really well worth it. It's a fantastic trip. You, you come away with this, this experience that just revolutionizes how you read and understand scripture. I mean, you, you've walked where Jesus walked. You, 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 the simplest things, I mean, obscure references now become incredibly profound points. You know, I really can't say enough about it. And in our trip, we, we had everything packed in our bus, and we were finishing up the last leg of our trip, and we were coming back into Tel Aviv to the airport, and we had uh, either had everything packed in the bus or we were carrying everything with us. And our group stopped for lunch on the way and then made our way back into the airport area. And another pastor who happened to be my roommate, uh, when we reached, it got inside the airport and he had all of his luggage, did that panicked pat down. Where's my passport? Oh, it was 96, so it was pre-9-11, so things were different. But his passport was missing, and we, we were lining up for security, and the security officers were, let's just say, they weren't sympathetic to his loss. Now, this, this is Israeli security. Even before 9-11, they were tough and serious and thorough. When, when I got to LAX, I got asked a question that apparently I gave a wrong answer to because I was pulled into a room with my luggage and searched. My luggage was searched, not me. And, you know, of course, standing there with a guy with a machine gun. You know, here I'm on a pastor's familiarization tour of Israel, and I'm, you know, there I am. But I, my, my friend, uh, my roommate for the trip, he he did not experience anything more relaxed in Israel itself. He, they, they asked if there was any way that he could prove who he was. And so he had a driver's license, but he was from one of those states where I could have replicated it with some fancy paper and a crayon and a photo and a laminating machine, you know. It, it was those days. I think things have improved even since then, but uh, no way. You know, business card, no way. He had a Bible with his name on it in gold in the front. God's word, you know. Not even God's word was proof enough that this was who he said he would be. It got me to thinking, you know, how do you, how do you really prove who you are? I don't mean with a passport, which was the only answer that the security officer wanted in Tel Aviv, or a driver's license, or what careers suggest about us, or what we tell others about who we are, or what others tell us who we are. Jesus talked a lot with his friends about how they should identify themselves. He said it, it wouldn't be by what we said we believed or the good that we hoped that we would do one day. No, he said that we would identify ourselves simply by how we loved people. It, it's tempting to think that the Christian faith is far more complex and interesting than that. Love isn't something that we, we fall into. Love apparently is something that we're to become. So St. Paul's trying to convince the church at Corinth of this truth in 2 Corinthians, a passage that we've been reading for the last few weeks in our series, This Is Us. And then the first sixth chapter, he's talked about various issues that they've been facing, and he comes to kind of the pinnacle of his thought here in chapter 6. And last week, we talked about the confidence that Christians would have in death and in life, that God in Christ has reconciled us to him and made us a new creation. And therefore, with one foot firmly in heaven, we can be confident living throughout our days. God in Christ is reconciling all things to himself, beginning with us. And then we get the opportunity, he said last week, to be Christ and God's representatives in this great scheme to reconcile the world to God. The gift that God ambassadors, is what he said, or representatives, if you will. We represent God in Christ to the world, and God is making his appeal to the world through you and me. Try that out on a Monday morning when you go into a staff meeting. That God is trying to make his appeal to the world through the likes of you and me. In, in today's lesson, we find out that it, it isn't going particularly well, at least not the way we thought, but Paul seems to think it's a success, a great success. He says, through afflictions and hardships and beatings and riots, and those are just the council meetings in, in Corinth. There we go. Good. I was hoping to get a rise out of our council president. <laughs> Even the Corinthians haven't, haven't returned Paul's from the gut 
heartfelt care for them. And so at the very end, before he changed topics and moved to a new direction, he caps his thought for the first six chapters with verses 11 through 13. You can look it up on your app. There's, there's the old school Bible underneath the chair in front of you. He says this, We have spoken to you frankly, Corinthians. Open your hearts wide to us. There's no restriction in our affections, but only in yours. In return, I speak as if you're my children. Open wide your hearts also. I think his advice is as good, maybe better today than it was even for the church at Corinth. Opening our hearts to one another in a decidedly closed-hearted age. If we're going to be good representatives of Christ, we, we must know what it means to be who we are. So our series is This Is Us, and we've been talking about lots of things. We, we know that nobody's perfect, that's one of our series, that God's love changes people, that's what we talked about on Trinity Sunday, and because of the fact that God's love changes people, everybody's imperfect, everybody then gets hope if God's love can change people, and everybody gets hope, last week's message was anything's possible, our gospel for today should have been a part of that, but if we were going to be God's representatives, his people, his church, then we must open our hearts to people, to the ones that God wants to reconcile. Paul said, our hearts are open to you. Open your hearts also. Such open-heartedness is part of the, the great command that Jesus gives to his disciples on the night in which he is handed over for death. Remember his words, John 13? I give you a new commandment, that you would love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also should love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are one of my disciples if you love one another. You can almost hear Paul's words here. So that in Christ, we're a new creation, reconciled to God through Christ's love, and now we're this representative of God in the world. That We have to open our hearts to the world so that God's love can pour in. Anybody feeling challenged by that these days? Anybody been on Facebook this morning? Then you're particularly feeling challenged by that this morning, aren't we? You know? We, we, know, we, we know we are Christians by our doctrinal purity. We know we are Christians because we got sacramental integrity. We know we are Christians because we don't own a big cathedral. What was the song? We know, they know we'll, we are Christians by our love. Wow, that seems super simple. But think about it for a minute. I'm sure you've already arrived at this before me. It's easy for me to love kind, lovely, humble people. It's easy. I mean, who wouldn't? I mean, these, these are the ones I've spent much of my life loving. And I tend to like to swim in that end of the pool. Loving people are so easy to love. They make me feel that I'm somehow good at it, you know? Because the people that I love and love me are kind and wonderful, and, and they tell me all the time what a great job I'm doing of loving them. You know? what, what I've come to realize, though, is that I'm, while I'm loving them, I'm avoiding loving other people, people that I don't understand, and, and people who are different than me. And, he, and here's why. See if it messes up to yours. Some people are creepy. Sure, I am polite to them, because I am polite. But sadly, I've spent my whole life avoiding the people Jesus spent his whole life engaging. And so the word becomes a question to me. God's idea is not that we would just give and receive love, that we would actually become it, that we'd represent it. By this, they will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. People who are becoming love and you've probably met a few, but there's not a lot of them. People who are becoming love see the beauty in others, even with their off-putting behavior that puts a very weird mask on their face. What, what Jesus told his friends could be summed up this way. God wants us to love everybody always. And to start with the people that creep us out the most. The truth is, you probably creep out a whole bunch of people too. I know I do. So Jesus gave us, there's two rules. One you know well. Do you know the golden rule? As you know, you're coming to a quiz. Pop quiz, if you fail, you have to go back to confirmation. Uh, the golden rule. Anybody know it? The U.S. gold makes rules. <laughs> the U.S. gold makes rules. Yeah. 
Yeah, that, that, is, that is a rule, but not the one that Jesus gave us. Yeah, there's a rule that we're kind of working against sometimes. Yeah, what is the golden rule? Very good, though. Very funny. <laughs> that was like glossolalia, speaking in tongues. Um, I think somebody, I'm sure it was George, said, you know, do unto others before they do it unto you. No, I mean, do unto others as you would have them have it done to you, of course. But did you know that there's another rule? A more precious metal even than gold? It's the platinum rule of Jesus. Do you know the platinum rule of Jesus? Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Oh! <laughs> what, Trevor Noah put it in the jar. Oh, I got an O. Put it in the jar. <laughs> wow. Yeah, you got it. Okay, you don't have to go back to confirmation, but the, those of you that are in confirmation still have to do it. So, did you know it? Absolutely. Just say absolutely. Yeah, right. So, Jesus said it like this in, in Luke 6. If you love those who love you, what credit do you get for that? For even sinners love those who love them. If you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? Even a pawnbroker does that. If you lend from those whom you hope to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to receive as much again. But I say to you, love your enemies, do good and lend, expecting nothing in return. Your reward will be great, and you will be children of the Most High, for He is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. Be merciful, just as your Father is merciful. I can hear the but, 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 but. Of course we do. Are there people that you should give a kind of a wide berth to? Yeah, indeed. There are people in, in your life and in mine who, who are unsafe people. They're, they're toxic people who delight in sowing discord, discord wherever they go. And I would say, if you're one of those people, just stop it. That's it. God, God gave us discernment. It's just that easy, you know. God gave us discernment, though, you know. We should use it as we live our lives. God, God also gave us love and understanding and kindness and forgiveness, the ability to forgive. He's put it in you, which has a power that we often leave untapped. There's a difference between good judgment and living in judgment. The trick is to use lots of the first and really, really sparing on the second. When we attempt to love other people, we will first have to tackle a great amount of fear. Anybody start feeling fearful when I was doing the love your enemies thing? If you didn't, you're not here. Thank you. There's one. Yeah. The attorney, of course. Yeah, she gets it completely. Um, yeah, absolutely. We should, we should love our enemies. That, you know, there, there's an awful lot of fear that we have to deal with when we're talking about loving difficult people. The, the fear may feel like the tempest that Jesus' disciples face. You know, really, Lord? You're going to ask us to love our enemies? And can anybody say that Jesus didn't ask that? Because he did. The fear that we encounter we, we, when we are challenged to love difficult people uh, with whom I, I feel afraid often is that, that, for me at least, I put up instant barriers, you know? And for me, it's probably similar to you, but I have a particular way. I use my intellectual boxes. Some of you caught me at it. My big words and my opinions. I construct these to protect myself. Barriers make me feel not safe. They make me feel right, <laughs> which that makes me feel safe. If I, I think that's something that we all do at some level, to some degree, and there's really no shame in it, Except it's not what Jesus said. And it's not what Jesus invited his people to look like. So I guess I got some growing up to do. He showed us what it means to become love when he spent his last meal, the last meal of his life, with a man who would betray him to death. And then died willingly a criminal's death, though he did no crime, and exchanged his perfect and pure life, for our sin-marred life. All this Jesus did because he loved imperfect people, difficult people. He even had in his inner circle some of the most difficult, lame, and blockheaded people. 
I know, if you, if you want to rise to defend the, gospel, uh, the, the disciples, just read Mark's gospel and you'll find out. We make loving people a lot more complicated than Jesus did. Every time I try to protect myself with my intellectual boxes or my big words or my opinions, God whispers in my ear and wants to know about my open heart. Is it open or not? Why are you so afraid, I hear? Who are you trying to impress, I hear? Am I really so insecure that I must surround myself only with people who will always agree with me? When people are flat wrong, you know, why do I appoint myself the sheriff that has to straighten them out, you know, the thought police? You know, and, and burning down other people's opinions doesn't make me right. You know what it makes me? An arsonist. God's purpose has always been to make your heart and my heart His heart. He wants us to love the people near us and the people that we keep far away. To do this, He wants us to live without fear. And this is why this passage is matched with the tempest on the sea. Because if you really take seriously loving the people you do not like or your enemies, you are going to experience the tempest deep within before you experience the tempest of mistrust with the person that you don't like. We, we, we don't need to use our opinions to mask our fears or our insecurities or my opinionated anger to, to make me feel better. The world, you know, I realized this week when I shared a post or something on, on Facebook and I, I kind of got to the end of all the typing of it and I realized this was God's word to me. You know, Craig, the world doesn't need one more incomplete self-righteous opinion from you. This is my relationship with God, you know. So watch where I'm leading you. Instead, God wants us to grow in love in our hearts and then cultivate that love inch by inch, acre by acre, and mile by mile into the world around us. This is a challenge that's before us. But love changes people, we've said in this series. Nobody's perfect, and so everybody's got brokenness. But everybody, because of God's great love, has hope in Christ. And because of that hope, even in a tempest on the sea, anything is possible. Open your hearts to its power. Our friend Ahu came, is she here today? There's so many of you on one service now, I can't tell who's here. Uh, our, our friend Ahu came from Iran. She, she was not of a Christian family. And so she was forbidden. It was a capital crime for her to convert to Christianity. But she became a Christian in mind while she was living in Tehran. Because she had a, a young friend when she was a teenager who, compared to Ahu, she said she was always so loving. She was always so peaceful. She was always so filled with joyful confidence. She was so loving toward me. And Ahu one day worked up the courage late in her, in her teenage years to ask why she was such a person, and her young friend said it was because that's who Jesus made her to be. They will know we are Christians by our love. It's a revolution. We become love when we open our hearts to the peace and love of God in Christ, and we realize how much God has had to do for you, an imperfect, broken person, just like he has done to all the other imperfect, broken people in the world. You know, the problem is, as we said in the no-joke curriculum we used, it, is that we usually measure our best against another person's worst. You know, and we like to burn that down, you know, our arson. And I, I give thanks to God for someone like Ahu, who was able to see what she wanted, a life that she wanted, and she was attracted to the fact that someone was willing to be love to her in the name of Jesus. This is us. Maybe better I should say, this should be us. Hearts wide open in a closed-hearted world. Jesus said simply, I have one command. Will you love one another? What, what, what is simple often isn't easy. But what is easy usually doesn't last. So I'm going to ask you to, to practice love, you know. Try it out. Try to replace your thoughts. You know, it might require you to get off Twitter 
or Instagram or Facebook for a little bit and kind of take control of your cognitive space and to practice it, to begin today. Remember, just remember God's great love for you as you focus. And then commit to acting in loving ways toward everybody always. <laughs> oh, it's going to be so hard. It's going to be a wrecked week. Next week you're going to come back looking haggard. You know. <laughs> Try it. See what God does. Try it with a troublesome child or a difficult place in your marriage or with that person at the office. Is, I choose to be love. I choose to be loved. You can't control someone else's behavior. You can't make them be loved to you. All you can do is follow Jesus and to look like him in the world. That's enough work. You don't have to be the general manager of the universe. Just focus on the one who loves you and has given his life for you and follow him. See what God does because we already said with God, anything's possible and to Jesus, all people, even the most creepy, are welcome. But that's next week. This is us. Everyone's welcome, even you. If you're going to introduce people to Christ, everyone's welcome. Your heart has to be wide open. Lord, let this be us. Amen.